obviously a tremendous honor to be back here, you know, not only for game day, but um, for the weekend, it's a special weekend for um, anybody and everybody involved with Michigan football. I think uh, the, um, the under the lights game is huge, it's big. Um, I was talking to some people yesterday, they said this ticket is higher to get than a Super Bowl ticket. And uh, I think it speaks volumes of about the uh, about both programs. Obviously, neither program is at the top of, of its game right now, but the attraction is still there because of the tradition and history of Notre Dame and University of Michigan. So um, it's an honor to be here and to, to be able to witness that. Um, obviously, I'm very humbled by the uh, the honor that they're going to bestow on me. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, the process, but when you're inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame, it's about a three-step process, and one of those steps is for you to be honored at your alma mater. Well, I didn't get the opportunity to be uh, honored at uh, University of Michigan last year because of my, my job with game day. But when we saw that Michigan had uh, scheduled Notre Dame for its first night game, I had made up my mind no matter where game day was that weekend, I was going to get on the plane and fly to Michigan to be honored at that game. It just so happened that the people, the good folks at ESPN, think highly enough of uh, the Michigan program and obviously Notre Dame too to bring game day here for this uh, first game under the lights. So it worked out pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good for me. But despite game day being here, I was going to be here to be honored because that's part of the uh, process when you're inducted to the College Football Hall of Fame. Uh, considering your history within the Notre Dame rivalry, how exciting is it for you to uh, have to be honored at a Michigan Notre Dame game? You know, it's very, uh, very exciting. Obviously, Notre Dame, they, uh, that team was a thorn in our side when I was here, and I knew, you know, that that 91 game we played here, there was no way I was going to walk off that field in defeat. So it's always, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a a rivalry that's, that's rich in tradition and respect. You know, you always respect that program. Even, even if you hate uh, them or during the game, you respect what they brought to the field because you know you, you knew you were about to play one of the top programs in the country. And, um, and that comes with a lot of respect. So it's, it's a huge honor to be recognized at the Michigan Notre Dame game. That's been your career for Mouse now. I think I can give these Michigan win eight games this year. Talk us through, is that still your pick, and what do you think of Brady Hogan out with this team? For Michigan to win eight games? Yeah, well, you know, as a as a alum and as a former player, I would hope it's more than eight games. <laughs> I'd be pleasantly surprised if it is. Um, I think that Brady Hoke is um, he's, he's the right fit. And people don't, you know, some people don't understand. Some people do, some people don't. And I think that um, when you look for coaches, you look for the right fit. And I believe that. Uh, Dave Brandon, athletic director, did a, um, a fantastic job of, you know, searching high and low for the guy who would be the right fit. And I think he um, came across that guy. And I'm not only impressed with what Brady Hoke has done, but also with what um, his staff has done. Um, Al Borges, I think that um, he's a, no a, a brilliant offensive mind. And obviously Greg Madison, the former defensive coordinator of the Baltimore Ravens uh, was quoted as saying, "There's only one job that he would, uh, one one college job that he would leave the NFL for, and it's this one at Michigan." So it speaks of the passion that he has for the program. Obviously, uh, Coach Hope said that you know, hey, Dave, I'll walk to Ann Arbor from San Diego. We don't need to talk money yet. It's 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 his dream job. So when you have coaches with that type of passion, um, coaching your young men. I think you're going to get a, a a very good product on the field. One of the one of my favorite games, regular season games, was actually in South Bend night game, and it was a 1990 game, and we lost that game in South Bend on some fluke plays. And I scored two touchdowns, and one of the touchdowns I scored when I went to the end zone, I promise you, you, look at the footage, I disappeared into the sea of people. I mean, it was standing room only. It was unbelievable. That atmosphere was like electric and it was my favorite uh one of my favorite regular season games even though you know 
we didn't win just because of the atmosphere. So I'm glad that uh, Dave and I believe his son Nick sat around talking and came up with this brilliant idea to have a night game in Ann Arbor. What do you expect the environment to be like Saturday night? Even better than it was in 1990 in South Bend. Even better, without a doubt. Desmond, you mentioned the fit. Have you seen specifics out of this coaching staff that, that lead you to believe that, that they're going to achieve at the level that you were accustomed to when you were here? Well, you know, it's still early, but and I'm not one who, who follows recruiting like it's, you know, like it's life or death, but, you know, a lot of people who do, and from the people who uh, follow recruiting um, very closely, they say that they're out there killing it on the recruiting trail, that they're just bringing in the type of players that, that, that you're accustomed to seeing play in Michigan and that um, are obviously some highly ranked recruits. Um, outside of that, the, the, the passion that it takes to develop these young men, it's one thing to bring in recruits, it's another thing to develop the talent. And I believe the passion that these coaches have for the uh, University of Michigan and the football program is going to translate into the development of these young men too. Um, as far as what I saw, and what was it not even not, not even three complete quarters, right? A football against Western Michigan. <laughs> I mean, you haven't seen these guys play a complete game yet. So you know, but I do like what I saw. I enjoyed it. So um, it, it seems like even seeing Denard on the center was was pretty refreshing <laughs> for me. How was that involved with you and Denard? I know you guys talked about how close you are. I mean, has that been something that's grown even more? You know, as, as these conversations and stuff? Yeah, well, you know, I don't know if, um, I mean, Denard can speak speak to this um, if you ever ask him, but Denard is a, is a kid who we, um, we were actually at the spring game going to his freshman year. So Denard was not an early enrollee, but Tate Forcier was an early enrollee. So Tate Forcier participated in spring that year. Denard Robinson didn't. When I was flying back to Miami from Detroit, Denard Robinson shared the flight with me. And in just a brief time I spoke to that young man, um, especially at baggage claim waiting for our bags, I was just instantly impressed with him. I didn't know anything about Denard because like I just told you earlier, I, I don't really follow recruiting that well. I, I just not what I do, you know. I, it's not my bag. I don't. I, I can really. Well, anyway, I don't follow, follow it that close. I didn't know who Denar was. You know, I just knew he was Denar Robinson. I didn't know he could have been. He could have been slow. He could have been a four-six guy. You know, I knew no idea who he was except he was an incoming freshman at the University of Michigan. And I was so impressed with him, just the way how humble he was. He was very nice. Um, obviously, he has. Um, a very engaging smile, and um, from that point on, you know, I just, hey, I know it's a transition from going from Florida up to Michigan, you know, climate change, different culture, you know, anything that you need to ask me, feel free, because I obviously live in Miami now, but I'm familiar with that culture up in Ann Arbor, and just, you know, lend myself to him as a, I guess, a sounding board if he had any questions or anything like that. And that's how we, we grew as friends. Never saw him play a down, didn't know what type of talent he had, and it was just because of how engaging he was and how humble he was and, you know, his, um, his winning smile. You know, he was just a great kid and a kid who, I mean, it's the type, you come across all sorts of kids in my profession, and there's some kids you root for. I, I, you guys are familiar with that, right? Some guys you just want to see do well because they just seem like such a great person. Denard is that guy. When I met Denard, that's how I felt about him. I just wanted him to do well. Yeah. You mentioned you were talking about the hockey season a little bit. Your poems, people still talk about it. How much do you get approached about that, and how much do people even talk to you about that? Oh wow! I mean, you can't measure it. Yeah, it's the number one thing people ask when they see me. Do the Heisman polls, you know. Do the Heisman polls. And, uh, you know, it just follows me. And uh, it was something that at the at the Hall of Fame enshrinement in uh, South Bend, um, John Gruden asked me to do it, and he tried to get the crowd behind him. And I don't know, you guys probably read what I said. Like, I don't do that anymore because I do it. And everywhere I go, people ask me to do it. And if I do it, then it cheapens that moment. So I just refuse to do it now. 
and just leave it for those who experienced it in Ann Arbor. And they respected that answer. You said in your book you were still considering whether you were actually going to do it while you were returning the funds? Correct. Yeah. I had, I, had, I had a couple of seconds to think about it. <laughs> I mean, once I saw that punter, it was like, okay, what am I going to do when I get in the end zone? <laughs> do you feel like it changed your life at all, doing that? I mean, obviously you maybe don't realize it at the time, but now, 20 years later? Yeah, of course, definitely. Yeah, it's changed my life, yeah. I mean, had I not uh, struck the pose, I think that chances are, I would have won the Heisman, I think, you know, still, mm -hmm. because it wasn't a close vote. But just what, what people still rec remember me or recognize me for a signature moment. So that moment pretty much, I think, changed my life. They said, okay, yeah, he won the Heisman. I mean, look, I get people who still think that uh, Rocket won the Heisman. He didn't even win it. <laughs> really, I mean, so it's like, you know, they may have remembered I won, they may not have. But then when you do something like that, that signature moment, then that kind of solidifies in their mind, yeah, yeah, he did win that trophy, didn't he? So I think it did uh, change my life. How worried are you about the sport that you love, given the headlines with Miami, with Ohio State, with any number of other programs under investigation? How worried am I? You know, I think that I'm – I'm hopeful that the play on the field would overshadow the scandals off the field. I'm hopeful. Um, but there are a lot of concerns out there, a lot of concerns. I don't know how I would measure it, but I'm very concerned about it because um, it's interesting. If people can't wrap their minds around a, a clean player or a clean program nowadays, and I have to remind people, I say, you understand that I played for a coach who was a no-nonsense coach. I mean, as players, I spoke to Anthony Carter a, f a couple of months ago. As players, we felt as though Bo Schembechler had eyes and ears everywhere on campus. That we couldn't do anything that wouldn't get back to the old man. I mean, that's how we felt as players. So you really didn't cross that line. It didn't even cross your mind to cross that line. You walked the straight and narrow. So now people today can't even wrap their minds around that because it's, it's so prevalent. But that's because the coaches don't have that type of respect from the community, from their players, and from everybody they let infiltrate it. That's the biggest difference to me. So when you look at what happened to Miami, I live in Miami. I've seen that scumbag Snake Shapiro. There's no way he could have walked in this room and you guys wouldn't think, would not think that he's scum. There's no way. It's impossible. But they dealt with this dude for eight years. And you're going to tell me no one knew. 